Greetings and welcome. We are in junior English. And today we are going to analyze and to uh, listen to the reading of two critically, vitally important essays by two really important female voices. Now, we've already pointed out, I think, a couple of times that often in our course study together, we've seen far more males represented than females. Write that down. That's an important observation. The number of male voices far superior to the number of female voices. The obvious question is why? Is it that, for your notes, is it that women were not writing? Now here I want to pause and inject a really important American writer named Tilly Olson, O-L-S-E-N. Olson wrote a really important essay called Silences. I want you to put that in your notes, Silences. Here's what she did. She went back in time and she asked a really simple question that became for her dramatically revelatory. She said to ask, why are there not more female voices that are in print? Why is it so few females, so many males? The answer to her question comes when she asks, how do we read a book? Now, I, I'm not talking about the skill set of learning how to read. I'm talking about physically, how do you read a book? Well, it has to be printed. For it to be printed, of course, first it has to be written. Then it has to be printed. Olson, in her essay, Silences, outlines her research. And guess what? Who owns the printing companies that publish for years and years and years, that publish all the writing? Men or women? What would you guess? All males. But wait, we're not done. Of all of the males who own printing houses across Europe and the United States, how many of those men do you think have skin color other than white? Fairly self-obvious, right? But she's not done. Of the white males who own all the publishing houses, how many of them are poor? How many of them do not have any money? Right. See, they come from the upper socioeconomic class. So Olson makes this dramatically remarkable observation. It's not that women weren't writing during all this time. It's that once they wrote something, they had no place to publish it. They could send anything they wrote to a publishing house, but the men who run the publishing house all come from a very slender strata of society. They're white, they're upper class, they all go to the same country club where they all have parking spots, you get the picture. In other words, if a woman were to write something that males of that group especially don't find particularly useful, they're not going to publish it. Now we have examples, several, of women who actually changed their name. One of the most famous is George Eliot. George Eliot is a woman. She publishes several novels. In the London Times, reviewers of her novels, assuming she's a man, write about how she's a rival to Charles Dickens. That's how good she is. Until the discovery is made, George Eliot's a woman. She changed her name to the name of a man. Gee, I wonder why. And it worked. And immediately the reviewers had to take a back step. First they argued she didn't really write it. Then they are, it was her husband who wrote it. Then they began to argue, well, if she did write it, there were flaws. We just didn't see those flaws. Let's point out everything that's wrong with it, because obviously a woman can't write as well as a man. By the time Olson is writing, she is already concerned with the fact of how many female voices have been, and now the title of the essay, silenced. Silenced. In other words, nobody knows about them. Of course, the obvious question will also be, not just writing, but in any number of other forms of art. Were women doing that artwork? Were there, for example, in the Renaissance, female painters? Were there female sculptures? And Olson will argue, yeah, many of them probably existed, but because they lived in a man's world, they were unable to have the experiences. Question, observation. How did she get her silences recognized then? 
Well, see, this is important, a great question. Olson is writing into the 20th century where a shift is beginning to take place in large measure because of a woman like Tilly Olson and many others as well. These women often are referred to as feminists. Now, this is a misunderstood phrase. Feminism in an academic setting simply means the study of female voices in the arts, whether it be in writing or otherwise. Two of the great feminist writers of the 20th century we now are going to enjoy. The first is the great Alice Walker, and the second is Sandra Cisneros. Now, let's, both, let's point out about both of these writers, and I'm with you now on page 1216 of your anthology and 1224 of your anthology. We're going to look at two classic essays. The first, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, is Alice Walker, the great writer of the famous novel, The Color Purple. Alice Walker will point out that in her life, her mother and her grandmother were remarkable people. They were artists of their own kind. Now, Walker's mother was a sharecropper. You can't get any more poor than this woman was. She had a large family, and she gave her whole life to housework. But, besi but besides working in the fields all day and making her children's clothes, of course her meals, Walker's mother found energy for a creative project, planting and tending a garden. Now this is crucial because it's easy to overlook something like this. And Walker, in fact, will report she did overlook something like this in her youth. It was only later when she got older that she realized, wow, my mom was an artist. But what she worked with was the only stuff she had at her disposal. Making of clothes, making of quilts, of course, planting of flowers. Now, a 3A observation, everyday use is an Alice Walker story that one or two of you read as sophomores last year, where two daughters fight over old quilts that were made many years before. One of those daughters has left home and come back to reclaim the quilt. The other daughter, scarred in a terrible fire, never left home. And at the end of the story, the mother has to decide who to give the quilt to. The popular one who went away or the ugly one who stayed behind. And she, of course, ends up making that choice from the perspective of what would be the best for both of them. Cisneros' poem, I call it a poem because it reads like a poem, talks about not the African-American female experience, but the Latino female experience. We often don't think about the fact that if you are female, and you grow up in a Latino American home, there are expectations on you that are quite remarkable as well. Cisneros writes about events that influenced and helped shape her as a writer. Beginning with a little story, what we call an anecdote, about the daunting task, the difficult work of making tortillas, she will point out it's fun to eat them, but it's not so always easy to make them. And uh, that's kind of where she begins. She reflects on ways her achievements have surpassed her expectations. She describes the way that her relationships to her parents and brothers, especially underline that one, her brothers, have affected her life and her work. She's traveled far, both literally and figuratively, turning, and this is the title of this essay, Straw of Everyday Life into the art of gold. Let's say it for both of these readings. The writers celebrate the simple power of art. In Alice Walker's case, amazingly simple flowers that change not only the world that you look at, but the world of the artist, the interior world. Walker will argue in many other places as well for the importance of a woman like her mother who always tried to beautify the world around her with what it is she had. All right, here we go. In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, one of the most classic essays on inspiration in art. Let's read it closely again. Hello? We're doing ACT prep. 
We took the ACT, but that was for practice for most of us. So we're really practicing still how to improve our reading comprehension. Again, if you could try it for the first three pages of this essay. If you can keep your pen moving with the flow of the reading, or even in front of it, you know you're doing okay as a reader. Give it a try again. Gardens, Alice Walker. How do ordinary people express their creativity? You are about to read an excerpt from Alice Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, in which the author remembers her mother, not a wealthy woman, caring for the flowers in her garden. As you read, consider how you usually define creativity, and whether Walker would agree or disagree with you. In the late 1920s, my mother ran away from home to marry my father. Marriage, if not running away, was expected of 17-year-old girls. By the time she was 20, she had two children and was pregnant with a third. Five children later, I was born. And this is how I came to know my mother. She seemed a large, soft, loving-eyed woman who was rarely impatient in our home. Her quick, violent temper was on view only a few times a year when she battled with the white landlord who had the misfortune to suggest to her that her children did not need to go to school. She made all the clothes we wore, even my brother's overalls. She made all the towels and sheets we used. She spent the summers canning vegetables and fruits. She spent the winter evenings making quilts enough to cover all our beds. During the working day, she labored beside, not behind, my father in the fields. Her day began before sunup and did not end until late at night. There was never a moment for her to sit down, undisturbed, to unravel her own private thoughts. Never a time free from interruption, by work or the noisy inquiries of her many children. And yet, it is to my mother and all our mothers Focus, who were please. not famous that I went in search of the secret of what has fed that muzzled and often mutilated but vibrant creative spirit that the black woman has inherited and that pops out in wild and unlikely places to this day. But when, you will ask, did my overworked mother have time to know or care about feeding the creative spirit? The answer is so simple that many of us have spent years discovering it. We have constantly looked high when we should have looked high and low. For example, in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., there hangs a quilt unlike any other in the world. In fanciful, inspired, and yet simple and identifiable figures, it portrays the story of the crucifixion. It is considered rare beyond price. Though it follows no known pattern of quilt making, and though it is made of bits and pieces of worthless rags, it is obviously the work of a person of powerful imagination and deep spiritual feeling. Below this quilt, I saw a note that says it was made by an anonymous black woman in Alabama a hundred years ago. If we could locate this anonymous black woman from Alabama, she would turn out to be one of our grandmothers, an artist who left her mark in the only materials she could afford and in the only medium her position in society allowed her to use. As Virginia Woolf wrote further, in a room of one's own. Yet genius of a sort must have existed among women as it must have existed among the working class. Change this to slaves and the wives and daughters of sharecroppers. Now and again, an Emily Bronte or a Robert Burns, change this to a Zora Hurston or a Richard Wright, blazes out and proves its presence. But certainly, it never got itself onto paper. When, however, one reads of a witch being ducked, of a woman possessed by devils, or sainthood, of a wise woman selling herbs, our root workers, or even a very remarkable man who had a mother, then I think we are on the track of a lost novelist, a suppressed poet of some mute and inglorious Jane Austen. Indeed, 
I would venture to guess that Anon, who wrote so many poems without signing them, was often a woman. And so our mothers and grandmothers have, more often than not, anonymously handed on the creative spark, the seed of the flower they themselves never hoped to see, or like a sealed letter they could not plainly read. And so it is, certainly, with my own mother, Unlike Ma Rainey's songs, which retained their creator's name even while blasting forth from Bessie Smith's mouth, no song or poem will bear my mother's name. Yet so many of the stories that I write, that we all write, are my mother's stories. Only recently did I fully realize this, that through years of listening to my mother's stories of her life, I have absorbed not only the stories themselves, but something of the manner in which she spoke, something of the urgency that involves the knowledge that her stories, like her life, must be recorded. It is probably for this reason that so much of what I have written is about characters whose counterparts in real life are so much older than I am. But the telling of these stories, which came from my mother's lips as naturally as breathing, was not the only way my I mother focused. showed herself as an artist. For stories, too, were subject to being distracted, to dying without conclusion. Dinners must be started, and cotton must be gathered before the big rains. The artist that was and is my mother showed itself to me only after many years. And this is what I finally noticed. Like Mem, a character in the third life of Grange Copeland, my mother adorned with flowers whatever shabby house we were forced to live in. And not just your typical straggly country stand of zinnias either. She planted ambitious gardens, and still does, with over 50 different varieties of plants that bloom profusely from early March until late November. Before she left home for the fields, she watered her flowers, chopped up the grass, and laid out new beds. When she returned from the fields, she might divide clumps of bulbs, dig a cold pit, uproot and replant roses, or prune branches from her taller bushes or trees, until night came and it was too dark to see. Whatever she planted grew as if by magic, and her fame as a grower of flowers spread over three counties. Because of her creativity with her flowers, even my memories of poverty are seen through a screen of blooms, sunflowers, petunias, roses, dahlias, forsythia, spirea, delphiniums, verbena, and on and on. And I remember people coming to my mother's yard to be given cuttings from her flowers. I hear again the praise showered on her because whatever rocky soil she landed on, she turned into a garden. A garden so brilliant with colors, so original in its design, so magnificent with life and creativity a that to artist. this day, people drive by our house in Georgia, perfect strangers and imperfect strangers, and ask to stand or walk among my mother's art. I noticed that it is only when my mother is working at her flowers that she is radiant, almost to the point of being invisible, except as creator, hand and eye. She is involved <laughs> in work her soul must have, ordering the universe in the image of her personal conception of beauty. Her face, as she prepares the art that is her gift, is a legacy of respect she leaves to me for all that illuminates and cherishes life. She has handed down respect for the possibilities and the will to grasp them. For her, so hindered and intruded upon in so many ways, being an artist has still been a daily part of her life. This ability to hold on, even in very simple ways, is work black women have done for a very long time. This poem is not enough, but it is something for the woman who literally covered the holes in our walls with sunflowers. They were women then, my mama's generation, husky of voice, stout of step, with fists as well as hands, how they battered down doors and iron starched white shirts, how they led armies 
head-ragged generals across mined fields, booby-trapped kitchens to discover books, desks, a place for us, how they knew what we must know without knowing a page of it themselves. Guided by my heritage of love of beauty and a respect for strength, in search of my mother's garden, I found my own. And perhaps in Africa over 200 years ago, there was just such a mother. Perhaps she painted vivid and daring decorations in oranges and yellows and greens on the walls of her hut. Perhaps she sang in a voice like Roberta Flax, sweetly over the compounds of her village. Perhaps she wove the most stunning mats or told the most ingenious stories of all the village storytellers. Perhaps she was herself a poet, though only her daughter's name is signed to the poems that we know. Perhaps Phyllis Wheatley's mother was also an artist. Perhaps in more than Phyllis Wheatley's biological life is her mother's signature made clear. All right, let's go now to the Cisneros uh, piece. Just drawn to gold. Straw into gold, the metamorphosis of the everyday. Sandra Cisneros. How does who you were change who you are? You are about to read an essay by Sandra Cisneros entitled Straw into Gold, The Metamorphosis of the Everyday. In this piece, Cisneros remembers her childhood as an awkward, shy child of Mexican immigrants and considers how she became a writer. Read along to learn more about how Cisneros' childhood shaped who she is today. When I was living in an artist colony in the south of France, some fellow Latin Americans who taught at the university in Aix and Provence invited me to share a home-cooked meal with them. I had been living abroad almost a year then on an NEA grant, subsisting mainly on French bread and lentils so that my money could last longer. So when the invitation to dinner arrived, I accepted without hesitation especially since they had promised Mexican food. What I didn't realize when they made this invitation was that I was supposed to be involved in preparing the meal. I guess they assumed I knew how to cook Mexican food because I am Mexican. They wanted specifically tortillas, though I'd never made a tortilla in my life. It's true I had witnessed my mother rolling the little armies of dough into perfect circles but my mother's family is from Guanajuato. They are provincianos, country folk. They only know how to make flour tortillas. My father's family, on the other hand, is Chilango from Mexico City. We ate corn tortillas, but we didn't make them. Someone was sent to the corner tortilleria to buy some. I'd never seen anybody make corn tortillas, ever. Somehow, my Latino hosts had gotten a hold of a packet of corn flour, and this is what they tossed my way with orders to produce tortillas. Así como sea, any old way, they said, and went back to their cooking. Why did I feel like the woman in the fairy tale who was locked in a room in order to spin straw into gold? I had the same sick feeling when I was required to write my critical essay for the MFA exam, the only piece of non-creative writing necessary in order to get my graduate degree. How was I to start? There were rules involved here, unlike writing a poem or story, which I did intuitively. There was a step-by-step -step process needed, and I had better know it. I felt as if making tortillas or writing a critical paper, for that matter, were tasks so impossible I wanted to break down into tears. Somehow, though, I managed to make tortillas, crooked and burnt, but edible nonetheless. My hosts were absolutely ignorant when it came to Mexican food. They thought my tortillas were delicious. I'm glad my mama wasn't there. Thinking back and looking at an old photograph documenting the three of us consuming those lopsided circles, I am amazed. 
Just as I am amazed, I could finish my MFA exam. I've managed to do a lot of things in my life I didn't think I was capable of, and which many others didn't think I was capable of either. Especially because I am a woman, a Latina, an only daughter in a family of six men. My father would have liked to have seen me married long ago. In our culture, men and women don't leave their father's house except by way of marriage. I cross my father's threshold with nothing carrying me but my own two feet. A woman whom no one came for and no one chased away. To make matters worse, I left before any of my six brothers had ventured away from home. I broke a terrible taboo. Somehow, looking back at photos of myself as a child, I wonder if I was aware of having begun already my own quiet war. I like to think that somehow my family, my Mexicanness, my poverty, all had something to do with shaping me into a writer. I like to think my parents were preparing me all along for my life as an artist, even though they didn't know it. From my father, I inherited a love of wandering. He was born in Mexico City, but as a young man, he traveled into the U.S. vagabonding. He eventually was drafted and thus became a citizen. Some of the stories he has told about his first months in the U.S. with little or no English surface in my stories in the house on Mango Street, as well as others I have in mind to write in the future. From him, I inherited a sappy heart. He still cries when he watches Mexican soaps, especially if they deal with children who have forsaken their parents. My mother was born like me, in Chicago, but of Mexican descent. It would be her tough, streetwise voice that would haunt all my stories and poems. An amazing woman who loves to draw and read books and can sing an opera. A smart cookie. When I was a little girl, we traveled to Mexico City so much, I thought my grandparents' house on La Fortuna, number 12, was home. It was the only constant in our nomadic ramblings from one Chicago flat to another. The house on Destiny Street, number 12, in the Colonia Tapillac, would be perhaps the only home I knew, and that nostalgia for a home would be a theme that would obsess me. My brothers also figured greatly in my art, especially the older two. I grew up in their shadows, Henry, the second oldest and my favorite, appears often in poems I have written and in stories which at times only borrow his nickname, Kiki. He played a major role in my childhood. We were bunk bed mates. We were co-conspirators. We were pals. Until my oldest brother came back from studying in Mexico and left me, odd woman, out for always. What would my teachers say if they knew I was a writer now? Who would have guessed it? I wasn't a very bright student. I didn't much like school because we moved so much and I was always new and funny looking. In my fifth grade report card, I have nothing but an avalanche of C's and D's, but I don't remember being that stupid. I was good at art and I read plenty of library books and Kiki laughed at all my jokes. At home, I was fine, but at school, I never opened my mouth except when the teacher called on me. When I think of how I see myself, it would have to be at age 11. I know I'm 32 on the outside, but inside, I'm 11. I'm the girl in the picture with skinny arms and a crumpled skirt and crooked hair. I didn't like school because all they saw was the outside me. School was lots of rules and sitting with your hands folded and being very afraid all the time. I liked looking out the window and thinking. I liked staring at the girl across the way writing her name over and over again in red ink. I wonder why the boy with the dirty collar in front of me didn't have a mama who took better care of him. I think my mama and papa did the best they could to keep us warm and clean and never hungry. We had birthday and graduation parties and things like that, but there was another hunger that had to be fed. There was a hunger I didn't even have a name for. Was this when I began writing? 
1966, we moved into a house, a real one, our first real home. This meant we didn't have to change schools and be the new kids on the block every couple of years. We could make friends and not be afraid we'd have to say goodbye to them and start all over. My brothers and the flock of boys they brought home would become important characters eventually for my stories. Louis and his cousins, Memi Ortiz and his dog with two names, one in English and one in Spanish. My mother flourished in her own home. She took books out of the library and taught herself to garden, to grow flowers Let's so this empty, place. We, be we had to put a lock well. on the gate to keep out the midnight flower thieves. My mother has never quit gardening. This was the period in my life, that slippery age when you were both child and woman and neither, I was to record in the house on Mango Street. I was still shy. I was a girl who couldn't come out of her shell. How was I to know I would be recording and documenting the women who sat their sadness on an elbow and stared out the window? It would be the city streets of Chicago I would later record as seen through a child's eyes. I've done all kinds of things I didn't think I could do since then. I've gone to a prestigious university, studied with famous writers, and taken an MFA degree. I've taught poetry in schools in Illinois and Texas. I've gotten an NEA grant and ran away with it as far as my courage would take me. I've seen the bleached and bitter mountains of the Peloponnesus. I've lived on an island. I've been to Venice twice. <coughs> I've lived in Yugoslavia. I've been to the famous Nice flower market behind the opera house. I've lived in a village in the pre-Alps and witnessed a daily parade of promenaders. I've moved since Europe to the strange and wonderful country of Texas, land of Polaroid blue skies and big bucks. I met a mayor with my last name. I met famous Chicana and Chicano artists and writers and politicos. Texas is another chapter in my life. It brought with it the Dobie Paisano Fellowship, a six-month residency on a 265-acre ranch. But most important, Texas brought Mexico back to me. In the days when I would sit at my favorite people-watching spot, the snaky Woolworths counter across the street from the Alamo, the Woolworths, which has since been torn down to make way for progress, I couldn't think of anything else I'd rather be than a writer. I've traveled and lectured from Cape Cod to San Francisco, to Spain, Yugoslavia, Greece, Mexico, France, Italy, and now today to Texas. Along the way, there has been straw for the taking. With a little imagination, it can be spun to gold. Okay, guys, so uh, now we'll do a little bit of work with